This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ died for us, and we too ought to lay down our lives for our sisters and brothers. If you have more than enough material possessions and see your neighbors in need, yet close your hearts to them, how can the love of God be living in you? My children, our love must not be simply words or mere talk. It must be true love, which shows itself in actions and truth. This then is how we'll know we belong to the truth. This is how we'll be confident in God's presence, even if our consciences condemn us. We know that God is greater than our consciences and that God knows everything. And if our consciences do not condemn us, my friends, then we have confidence before God and we will receive whatever we ask from God's hand. Because we keep the commandments and do what is pleasing in God's sight. The commandments are these that we believe in the name of God's own, Jesus Christ, and that we love one another as we were told to do. Those who keep these commandments live in God and God lives in them. We know that God lives in us by the spirit given to us. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. To grasp this concept of love and the meaning of how to love and why we love one another, we must revert back a little bit on some of the scripture to the first part of 1 John 3. See what love God has given us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when Christ is revealed, we will be like Christ. The writer uses this imagery of God adopting each faithful being into God's family, lavishing them with love. And this love of God has been seen throughout the ages and will continue to be seen in their time as well. Adoption was quite common in the Roman period. Yet, it was more common for a grown man to be adopted than a child. When a family was without children, they would adopt another man to come and take on their name and carry out their lineage. The adopted son would sever ties with the old family, and this would include relief of any types of debt owed under the old family's name. Any of y'all want to adopt me? I got some debt. <laughs> got. He would become a whole new person and in a new context with a new inheritance and a new name. Adoption was for the namesake and the inheritance. So what is being done by God is nothing new. Rather, for different reasons, while these believers obtain a new name and a great inheritance, we are adopted into the family of God, foremost because of God's great compassion and love. See what love God has for us, that we shall be called children of God. The what love is based on the Greek word potipin, 
which literally means of what country. The writer is saying, what foreign country did this strange, amazing love come from that we could be called children of God? And and possibly the writer is using Potipin in a more generic way of what type or what kind of love is this that it could be so amazing In either case, the writer shows wonder and amazement, bewilderment that God would treat such sinners so graciously. The God would take individuals that have been part of the world and lavish love and grace and kindness and joy and peace and mercy upon them. What foreign love is this that we've never seen before? One writer calls this the spirituality of poo. Ahmed was a new father, and for the first six weeks of his daughter's life, her poop looked like golden little nuggets. It didn't stink. It was magical. And eventually, it turned into a weapon of mass destruction. (laughs) The smell, and sorry for the image of leaky diapers, began for him to understand that it wasn't made for the weak of stomach or heart. Yet he noticed something amazing. There was no resentment towards his child or even disgust. While it was still gross and nasty, Ahmed still loved his daughter more than he hated the dirty diapers. A love stronger than really anything. It was a lesson of a lifetime that love was stronger than hate, that love overcomes disgust. Love is stronger than poo. It's a love that is from God. Love leads to God. Love carries God. Love is God. He states that it's a take your child into your bed when you haven't had good sleep for weeks because she's had a bad dream kind of love. It's a forgetting forget to seeing cool movies and reading the latest books and replacing them with Disney and Pixar kind of love. It's the I will serve you because there is no love without service kind of love. It's the put someone else's needs before your own wants kind of love. Love. It's a reminder of God's love that is absolute and forgiving of all. The idea that God loves us despite our dirty diapers, despite the sin we have carried, and yet still calls us children. And Lord, how dirty some of us are been. So often we haven't reflected this same love through our neglect to one another. It's no wonder that the text says that the world did not recognize Jesus because it seems of a lot of the so-called children of God looks like the world rather than God. The continuous cycle of finding our spirituality in everything other than the love of God. And the thing is, the more we turn to the world, the more we turn into the world. St. Augustine states, For those who are called children and are not children, what profit them the name? But they are not. How many are called physicians but know not how to heal? How many are called watchers but sleep all night long? How many are called Christians and yet their deeds are not found to be? Because they are not actually what they are called in this life. 
In other words, live into your identity or remove, remove it from your name. Having this title, children of God, ask of us that we recognize our sin and repent evil. That we turn and act in ways for our dear parent, that we love one another with great abandon. As we look back to what Greg Garrick talked about last week, we are not bouncers of God's kingdom, but rather ushers into this kingdom that we draw nearer together, calling into another's humanity, not to push them away, but bring them into the fold as the great shepherd brings each of us into a great fold building into safety and security, reminding them of who they are and whose they are in the love of God. Bearing into the child of God title, we reflect into a world that is creative and redemptive work of God that is so foreign than what we've ever known before. See what love God has for us. That we are called children of God. Fred Craddock and his wife were vacationing in the Great Smoky Mountains. And they were at the Black Bear Inn enjoying their lunch. And all of a sudden, an elderly man stopped by their table and began to force a conversation. Craddock was quite annoyed, but being a pastor, he knew he couldn't show how annoyed he was. The man asked Fred his occupation, and he said he was a Christian minister. And all Christian ministers know that once you do that, it's over, because everybody's about to repeat their sins. They're about to tell you stories you don't care about, all those things. I, I need to repent that I make up an occupation every time I'm in uh, on an airplane. Uh, I don't have the patience for it. Uh, pray for me. Anyway, <laughs> that part was not written in the sermon. Anyway, uh, <laughs> the man said, I owe a great deal to a Christian, a minister of a Christian church. And he went on to tell his story. He said that I grew up in these mountains and my mother was not married and the entire town knew it and everyone called me an illegitimate child or another word. In those days, people just wanted to shame me and it worked because I felt ashamed. At school, the kids said horrible things to me and I ate lunch all alone and stayed to myself at recess. In my early teen years, I began to attend a church called Laurel Springs Christian Church. It had a minister who was attractive and frightening. He had a chiseled face and a deep voice. I don't know why, but I would constantly go and hear him preach. However, I was so afraid that I was not welcome since I was who I was. So I would go to the church in late and I would leave so that no one would ever say, what's a boy like you doing in church? One Sunday I couldn't get out and all the people were in the aisles talking and laughing and all of a sudden I felt this heavy hand on my shoulder. And I knew who it was. I turned and my eyes caught a glimpse of that chiseled face looking up at him with great fear. He stared at me for a while and I knew what he was doing. He was about to make a guess of who my father was. And he said, well, boy, you're a child of... And he paused. 
And I knew it was coming. I knew my feelings would be hurt. And I knew I would never go back to this church again or probably any other church ever. And he said, boy, you're a child of God. I see such a striking resemblance. He swatted me on the butt and said, go now and claim your inheritance. And I left there a different person. In fact, that was the beginning of my life, I would say. As I look out to each and every one of you, I see such striking resemblances into our God. Striking resemblances into the one who created us and molded us and shaped us and continues to mold and shape us. It's not in the eyes, it's not in the ears, it's not in the nose, it's not in the hands, but definitely in the heart. So go now, my friends, and claim your inheritance. Amen.